Hi, thank you for tuning in. This is part 14 in our series, The Gospel of the Kingdom. Now, before diving into this session, I just wanted to share this with you, that if you have been watching along the various Bible studies over the weeks, you may have got the impression that I'm researching these topics and then sharing thoughts that, um, that I've discovered in the scriptures. But really, this is a personal journey. And what I'm finding is that week after week, the Lord is opening certain things to me. And so they are fresh things that I'm dealing with and considering. And then I share these with you as well. So I apply them to myself and then I offer them to you to consider before the Lord. And if the Lord so leads you, that you would likewise um, give yourself to these great truths and apply yourself to them. I don't predetermine what will be spoken about next week or the following week. But what I find is that once I've finished one session, the Lord just opens the door and I begin to see certain other things freshly. So while these are uh, topics and subjects and scriptures, passages of scripture that are very familiar and we've read them many times and I've even spoken about them many times in different places. But what I am finding is that there's a freshness about these things and in a certain way quite terrifying because it's, it's highlighting the fact that for most of my Christian experience, I've not understood these things. And so um, it's very challenging to now find that these things are opening up in a far greater, more powerful and more profound way than I've ever seen them before. Now, that may not be your experience, but it is mine. And I trust that what we're sharing together in these uh, topics and in these wonderful scriptures that you will be enriched by them. So the question that cropped up in considering this week's session is this. What precondition is required to qualify as a candidate for the kingdom of God or for the, for the kingdom of heaven? What kind of heart condition, what kind of attitude is necessary within us to qualify, to give us entrance into the kingdom of God? And this is what Jesus deals with in a very familiar passage of scripture. But I want to revisit it and trust that some fresh and clear thoughts will come out from this. So I'd like to take another look at the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I know I've dealt with this subject in previous um, messages and videos, but I'd like to take a careful look at the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount because it is absolutely vital. There's some great truths that we need to consider here. So firstly, let's look at this. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So notice here is Jesus going up on a mountainside. And this must surely ring a bell because Moses went up into the mountain to meet with God. And that's where he got the revelation of the first covenant and the law. So here is the Lord Jesus going up on a mountainside. And as he uh, preaches the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and presents these great truths to us, he is like a second Moses. In fact, he's greater than Moses. And that comes out very clearly in the Sermon on the Mount. A couple of years ago, while reading Matthew 5, 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, I wrote a blog and I called it the State of the Kingdom. Very similar to what the president does when he reads out the State of the Nation address. So this was the king addressing us concerning the kingdom and the state of the kingdom, the values of the kingdom, and those who are part of the kingdom, this is how they should look and this is how they should live. This is a, a profile of a normal human being in the presence of God and the way God intends us to be. This is what he intended Adam to be, to bear his image. So Jesus unfolds these things. Now he starts off with what we have come to call the Beatitudes, the blessings. Blessed is this and blessed is that. This blessedness, the blessing means favor or happiness. Happy are those. And so the Lord then sets them out. Now, what we need to, I believe, consider very carefully is that while it may appear that blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, etc., 
it may seem that he's talking about different groups of people. So there are some people that are poor in spirit. There are some that are mourning. There are some that are meek. We need to take all these Beatitudes as a progressive growth as we come to the knowledge of the kingdom of God. So these conditions or preconditions should be found in our hearts, in every one of us, as we enter the kingdom of God. So that's the, the vital part of this message that I want to put across to you. Let's be reminded as we look at these Beatitudes, that from the time that God predicted that the seed of the woman would eventually come and crush the head of Satan, there was an expectation throughout the scriptures that Messiah would arrive. And this was the moment when he had arrived. And this is his message. So this is what the Bible calls the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. So here was the Lord Jesus. And his main message throughout his earthly ministry was the kingdom of God. And now he's presenting us with the kingdom of God. And he's telling us those who would qualify for the kingdom of God. So he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that one is repeated with a little more detail. So these are the Beatitudes. And this is the introduction that the Lord Jesus gives to us of the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I've already said, all of these Beatitudes apply to each one of us. So we can't pick and choose between them and say, well, maybe I am meek and therefore that one applies to me. Um, but perhaps I'm not mourning at this point, but I realize there are some who might be mourning. So we can't pick and choose. They actually, all of them apply to us. And this is the doorway or the entrance into the kingdom of God that Jesus is presenting to us. So it's absolutely vital that we recognize our position before God. Now, if you happen to have seen the Bible study that we gave last week, then you will know that Jesus confronted the Laodicean church with this challenge. He said, you say, I am rich and I have need of nothing. But he said, you don't realize that you're poor, wretched, pitiful, blind and naked. Now, because Jeremiah tells us that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, we are inclined to justify our position. And because we've accumulated uh, comforts in this world, we tend to feel that we're okay. But when we allow the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to truly put His spotlight upon us and reveal our lives in the light of God's holiness and glory and righteousness, we then realize that we are in fact poor, wretched, pitiful, blind and naked. Uh, and this is really what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now I'd like to take you to a psalm where David spells this out very beautifully. And, and this is not a message to unbelievers, but even those of us who've been Christians for a long time, we may not realize our true position in the light of God's righteousness and purity. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So we need the spotlight to shine upon us. As, as David also said, search me, O God, and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. So it's important that we do come to this place and allow the Lord to really put his spotlight on our lives. And so let's look at what David has to say. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. 
There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds. My strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. Jeremiah tells us that the heart of man is deceitful above all things. So it deceives us and it is desperately wicked. So we need to be very aware of that as we consider these things carefully. As David writes, all my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. So the Lord sees it into the very depths of our hearts. As the book of Hebrews also tells us, everything is open and naked before him with whom we have to do. God sees everything. Now I know that most of us have been brought up on a very rich diet of grace. And the impression that we have gained is that we're covered by the righteousness of Jesus. So God doesn't look at me as I really am, but he looks at me in Christ. And while that is true, it is not the true condition of our heart. The righteousness that God has given to us is an imputed righteousness. So we are covered by the righteousness of Jesus, or the work of Jesus is what we put our trust and our confidence in. But let us understand it in this way, that that righteousness gives us access to God the Father. Without the covering of the Lord Jesus, we would not be able to approach God the Father. But we are accepted, the Bible says, in the Beloved. So we now can come before the Lord. But we are to come boldly before Him, before the throne of grace, and this is what it says in Hebrews, to obtain mercy and to find grace to help us in our time of need. So while this righteous covering gives us access to God, it is not a covering to hide what we really are, because what we really are needs to change. The gospel of the kingdom is a transforming gospel. It is the power of God to salvation, as Paul tells us. So the gospel needs to change our lifestyle, change our attitude, change our hearts, we need to be changed from the inside. Um, the fancy theological word, of course, is sanctification. But I'm not using that word because it's not a word that we use in our day-to-day -day living. We don't say, well, I had a very sanctified day today. Um, but let the, the Spirit of God mold us and change us. And so that's what Jesus is introducing us to here. This is what the kingdom of God is like, and this is how I need to be if I'm going to be a member of his kingdom. I need to first recognize my poverty of spirit, to realize that I'm actually poor in spirit, and then to allow these beatitudes to be a progressive growth and realization and revelation to my own heart. So let's consider these in a little more detail. Just before taking a deeper dive into the Beatitudes, let's be reminded about what Paul teaches us concerning grace. Now remember, it is Paul who is taught that the imputed righteousness covers us. We have the covering of the righteousness of Jesus. But this is what he says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. King James says, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So we mustn't misuse and misunderstand this whole subject of grace. He then goes on to tell us in 1 Corinthians, and he's writing to believers, not to unsaved people. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. There's a great deception in the, in the church today, believing that grace just covers a multitude of sins. But that is not the case. 
as Paul very clearly tells us. He says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Grace will not cover these things. He then also tells us in 2 Corinthians, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. In other words, the righteous covering will be removed and we will stand exposed before Jesus on that day and he will see us as we really are. Now thank God as we confess our sins and truly repent, he washes away our transgressions, he casts them as far as the east is from the west and he says, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That is wonderful and comforting. Thank God for the grace of God that does wash away our sin. But if we have not allowed the grace of God and the Spirit of God and the Word of God to transform us, we will stand exposed before the Lord. And that's what the Lord Jesus is talking about here, that to enter into the kingdom of God, we need to be changed. A change must take place. That change can only take place when we recognize how poor we really are in spirit before the Lord. So let's take a deeper dive into these things for a moment. Okay, so allow me to illustrate how that each one of these Beatitudes is an essential part of our growth and our entrance into the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is presenting to us. So the very first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's remember that the scripture tells us very clearly that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So let's just open our minds and consider this very carefully. While it is true that each one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God, in the most amazing and wise way, God is using that very sin, if we will acknowledge it and recognize it, to bring us to a place of destroying our pride and making us poor in spirit. So in other words, if we really allow the Spirit of God to search our hearts and reveal our true position in the light of his righteousness and purity and sinlessness, we will recognize how poor and wretched and blind and naked we really are. And this brings about a poverty of spirit. But this is good because it's a precondition for us to enter into the kingdom of God. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy are those, favored are those, who are poor in spirit. So let's not uh, try to justify ourselves in any way, but open our hearts and be absolutely honest before the Lord, because this actually works in our favor to make us recognize what we really are like in his sight, because this is the beginning of the change that he can bring about in our hearts and in our lives. Now, the next one is, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, while we may think about mourning because we've lost a loved one, it's actually mourning because of our sinful condition and the consequences of those sins. Let's realize that our sin can disqualify us from our eternal life in the presence of God in the new earth, in the kingdom of God. So there is a reason to mourn because of our poverty, our brokenness, our nakedness before him. It brings about a mourning. And, and that psalm that we read where David expresses this in the most magnificent way, uh, that's really the condition that we need to recognize within ourselves. And then he says, Blessed are the meek. Now the meek are not passive but the meek are just not arrogant. And, and a lot of Christians are very arrogant in the way they conduct themselves. So blessed are 
the meek, when we recognize the grace and the mercy of God that has been offered to us in Christ, we need to walk very meekly. As I said, not passively, but carefully with reverence and godly fear because the Lord has redeemed us and the calling is so high, the rewards are so great. And this causes us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. So if we recognize our poor spiritual state, we mourn because of it. We're not arrogant about the things that we've come to see. And we now begin to hunger and thirst after the true righteousness that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So while we are thankful for the imputed righteousness of Jesus, which gives us access to God, we're now hungering and thirsting for our lives and our hearts and our attitudes and our motives to be changed, to be like the Lord. Then this causes us to be merciful because God has been merciful to us in our sinful state. He is calling us into his kingdom. He is changing and, and molding us because we have experience the mercy of God, we now are merciful, not judgmental, critical, backbiting to others, but merciful, very careful in the words that we choose to describe others and speak to others. Mercy comes from our hearts. And that purifies our heart, purifies our motives, purifies our attitudes, and the pure in heart will see God. And because we're pure in heart, we will be peacemakers, not compromising the word of God, but endeavoring in every possible way to make peace with our brothers and sisters, not trying to find reasons to separate ourselves from one another and cause division, but rather be a peacemaker. And this, of course, will cause us then to be persecuted. Because the devil will be against us, the world will be against us, and as Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you as well. So this condition of heart will bring about persecution and trial. But blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this is how we progress into the kingdom of God, and this is the only way in. We need to go through all all of these things that Jesus is presenting to us as the way into the kingdom of God. These are the, the blessings, the happiness, the favor of God that comes upon us as this condition in each one of these beatitudes becomes our experience as we enter into the kingdom of God. So let me in conclusion just illustrate this whole concept with an experience that I had. A friend of mine took me into a very rural area and showed me a Zulu hut. This was not one of the huts that the tourists are shown, but this was a genuine hut where a family of Zulus was living. And what struck me about it was that the door was so low and so small that to gain entrance to this hut, I had to get down on my all fours and crawl through the door. Once I was in the hut, I was able to stand up quite comfortably. My friend then explained that this was a security measure because if any intruder were to try and gain access to the hut, they'd have to come in on all fours and they would be in a, a crouched position and they could easily then be knocked over the head with a knob carry or even have their head taken off with a machete or a panga. Now, why I mention this is because this illustrates what Jesus is saying about our access into the kingdom of God. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be poor in spirit. We need to mourn. We need to um, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Be meek, be merciful, be peacemakers. This condition of heart, it is the absence of pride. In absolute humility, we now enter into the kingdom of God. As Jesus said, Narrow is the way, straight is the gate. It's difficult. Few there be that find it. So it's important that we humble ourselves and come this route into the kingdom of God because the rewards are absolutely mind-blowing. 
And finally, it is so worth it, so worth the effort, because as Jesus says, do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God the Father wants to give us the kingdom more than we want to receive it. May we humble ourselves before him and not lose this golden, glorious, wonderful opportunity. Amen.